All right, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to the organizers for including me, an archeologist, in this very interesting, stimulating conference uh, with all of these discussions that are bringing up uh, themes that are, that are really interesting and relevant on so many levels. And I want to also uh, take the advantage of, of uh, relishing in the fact that I will follow on Oliver's uh, presentation, uh, because we will now move from a linguistic turn toward a material turn. And um, I will take, I will present a paper that takes archeological and anthropological perspectives on objects or the informal art created in the Ravensbrück camp. And so uh, we will now use the material items and the materiality of the past as a way in of connecting to it and understanding it. The focus of this paper will not be on uh, the work of art of any formally recognized artist, which is what we saw most of yesterday, uh, but instead we'll uh, look closer at the transformative dimension of the production and use of these objects. And I think that it is also fair to uh, maybe question me in presenting this in a conference on art. Some might more, may more want to qualify this as craft. Uh, it's fair, but I think that there are still some really interesting generalizable uh, ideas about the role and the transformative power of the production and use of these of these things. The ability for objects and art to trigger emotional and mnemonic responses, even narratives, has since Proust's famous rendition of the Madeleine dunk in hot tea found a powerful metaphor that allows us to physically feel not only the sensory experience of an involuntary memory from a withdrawn past, but also grasp the enormity of the narrative triggering it. This crucial moment, as told to us in uh, A la recherche du temps perdu, unlocks the narrative of the author's childhood memories and transports us and the narrator into the past. This is a powerful image, and along with other dormant material presences in the world around us, we often think about these materialities as something we engage with in a periodic way, sometimes involuntary, and at times in a manner that can be likened to a form of meditation, a time set aside uh, to experience and feel at a, at a deeper level, like going to a museum exhibit or a heritage site. Beyond the narrative, the engagement with these objects are often, like exemplified by Proust, a sensory embodied experience that draws us in beyond realms captured by language, affecting us emotionally, even physiologically, triggering goosebumps, shudders, sweat, affected breath, tears, a sense of well-being, etc. All embodied states deeply connected to narratives. I will use a concept here called episodic embodied narratives developed by, by Aaron Stutz and uh, this paper resides in a collaborative uh, thought around this collection with regards to that. The paper will explore the episodic embodied narratives but not through the involuntary and obstinate traces that are triggered against the explicit will of the agent but rather the effect active calling forth of such experiences through the voluntary manipulation and even production of material objects. To make this case, I use the example of the illicit production of small items in the context of the Ravensbrück camp, um, and I will discuss how these small active, uh, objects actively called upon to affect the daily lives of people, in, the case, in this case incarcerated in extremely controlled environment, to support a sense of self among the people whose humanity depend on them. The paper will present how the engagement with these uh, items triggered uh, episodic embodied narratives and how the physical engagement with them affected not only the mindset of the women who engaged with them, but also created emotional states that in turn would trigger further associations and experiences, transforming these objects into active agents in the creation and recreation of personhood and humanity in the prisoners through acts of resistance and solidarity. And I will also touch upon how these objects now, as they are presented in a museum exhibition in Lund, uh, can uh, engage also with the viewer in this kind of work of remembrance and, and understanding. The Museum uh, Kulturen in Lund, Sweden, houses a unique collection of small items made, kept, and curated by the prisoners of Ravensbrück, which, as you all know, was established as a forced labor camp in 1939, 
in a small village, 900, er, sorry, 90 kilometers north of Berlin. During the period of occupation uh, from 1939 to 45, an estimated 130,000 women from across Europe were sent to Ravensbrück. And while um, established as a working camp, mainly for political prisoners, the conditions worsened over time. And toward the end of the war, Ravensbrück itself was used as an extermination camp. In each period of its use, though, conditions were extremely hard. The majority of the prisoners died of disease, exhaustion, starvation, or in the gas chambers built in vicinity to the camp. Only about 15,000 of the women survived until the liberation in 45. And at the end of the war, 6,815 prisoners were handed over to the Danish and Swedish Red Cross. 2,755 of these were carried by the white buses and 3,960 by train. As these women arrived in the port of Malmö, they carried with them only their clothes. Yet, some managed to bring with them small items and documents hidden in their garments. These artifacts make up the collection at Kulturen, with a complementary archive of books and diaries housed at the University Library in Lund. The items range from everyday small act, uh, objects and tools such as scissors, to embroidered camp badges, rosaries and scraps of paper filled with text. They were collected and saved by the Polish art historian Sigmund Lakoszynski, who also interviewed several of the, their owners about the role of these material items inside the camp. The result is a collection of the material culture of resistance and resilience in the face of a socio-materially and ideologically utterly brutal world. And here are a few, a selection of the kind of, of, of of materials that are in this collection. The Ravensbrück collection documents the active, embodied creation of mo uh, moments of refuge from abject circumstances. The prisoners' embodied interactions with these material objects were intimately intertwined with their own effective transformations, which in turn were part of a recursive uh, creation, curation, and modification of episodic embodied narratives. The effective transformation and its iconic representation in memory links present emotional experience with both memories of the past and the extrasomatic environment, potentially allowing individual agents to create their own humanity, even in such extreme circumstances. Lakoszynski's interviews with the Ravensbrück survivors testify to how important the episodic embodied narratives were when they were triggered by the objects and how the role that they played in mediating, in agency, uh, in creating actions, feelings, and memories, and narratives of hope. Effective engagement, um, memory, and the material environment interacted to construct strategic acts for survival and uh, the assertion of personhood for the women who made, used, and shared them. Thus, the objects themselves are powerful examples of how material culture works with bodily affective dynamics to resist the dominating structures of dehumanization, such as those defining a place like Ravensbrück or any concentration camp or ghetto. The women's words reveal that the processes involved in making and using the small uh, material items uh, and the objects of their past and potential future included both felt states, remembered images, and cross-modal sensory motor associations relating to the use of symbols. The interviews with the survivors allow us to catch a glimpse um, of the ways in which these objects operated inside the camps. Some prisoners describe the embodied technological engagement with material remains as therapeutic escapism. When I sat fiddling with tiny things like making dogs and cats, I was totally relaxed in my body and breathed normally. Then I was together with my father and my brother again. The same informant Inger states, Busying myself with things made me feel like a human being. It wasn't all just slaps and blows and shouting. Telling a story on the theme of escapism involved emotionally hopeful memory making. Notably, it also simultaneously involved material culture production to make iconic, extrasomatic, durable representations of things like domestic pets. The spreading awareness of one's body as an intentional object, simply in the act of sitting still and experiencing autonomic rhythmic functions, a palpable bodily sense of having temporarily escaped the slaps and blows and shouting, 
and a very general indexical symbol, the term human being, but ten pointing toward a self who can carry out unreflected routine practices as one did in the past with family members from whom one has been likely violently separated, and as one could do in the future. Indeed, erasing the past was one of the total totalitarian strategies for, of dehumanizing the prisoners. The exhibition describes how some of the women uh, counteracted the daily oppression by employing a sociolinguistic and corporal strategy or an effectively mediated, intensely retrospective one. They simply acted to remember as many descriptive details as possible from their previous lives. Through the recall of these memories, it became possible to imagine that there would be a time also after the camp. Inger states, thinking about the past was a way to escape. I took pleasure in the fact that the Nazis didn't know that I could hide in my memory. They, could only take, they couldn't take the delight in the memories away from me. Memories of mundane, otherwise forgettable details now become associated with a pleasurable, emotion-laden, uh, episodic, embodied narrative. These strategies of recall and memorization were then externalized through the production of small items made real through materiality. Scraps of paper were used to materialize memories through writing texts like recipes of desserts or drawings of maps like this one of a landscape left behind. In their materiality, these act actively constructed memories become more real as tools for self-definition. The production of objects in an environment of extreme scarcity relied on the ability to recuperate, sne uh, sneak, and steal materials from the camp. The prisoners themselves refer to this as organizing, borrowing a term that symbolized resistance rather than, some, than illegality. One of the interviewees, Apollonia, stated, you were always on the lookout for something that you could use to make something with. The constant, effectively engaged, vigilant search for raw materials under conditions of armed surveillance in the presence of other prisoners with similar interests would have structured everyday life. The illicit engagement with material resources allocated for camp production of military uniforms and other clothing products became a strategy for protecting one's humanity. The focus on getting away with taking scraps also resulted in an everyday routine involving extended bouts of heightened affect likely associated with emotional extremes, fear and excitement. The use of these small items, produced or recovered, could enter into the realm of active but discreet resistance. The interviews mention a group of women who made a point to each week look for a small item that they could use to embellish themselves on Saturday. It could be a simple string to tie in the hair or a pin found somewhere. This use of material items was a strategy to prevent the Germans from breaking their spirits." Unquote. This technologically restrained strategy of redefining the body became semiotically marked against a wider environment facing near total deprivation of agency and individuality. It is easy to imagine how the weekly task gave the participants a symbolic focus, which mediated and was sustained by their effective engagement. They were able to create their own community through ritual provisioning and performance on a small social scale and under the poorest of circumstances. Objects were also exchanged and circulated to form and maintain ties between prisoners. Drawings and small pieces of embroidery were common as birthday gifts. In her memoir about the imprisonment at Ravensbrück, de Gaulle Antonioz describes how several women would pull breadcrumbs together to knead into a small cake with a bit of jelly. The interviews indicate that gift giving was a significant practice for community building within the camp, an account that differs from the more um, sordid narratives by Primo Levi from Auschwitz. Levy described loneliness as a fundamental experience of Auschwitz, where every other individual was a potential thief, threat, or enemy. The women in Ravensbrück told how they created and maintained a social world through uh, pity material theft from the Nazi guards, followed by secret production and exchange. The effective transformations involved in material exchange likely trained selective attention on self and other in the immediate environment. And in the conditions in Ravensbrück, the material transaction, even of the smallest token, would never be routine. Rather, the emotional reverberance would likely have been sustained and intense. The joint effective transformation of giver and receiver, perhaps amplified if visited in a small group of allies, would have been difficult to hide. If such an illicit gift economy 
uh, could be established, yes. it would have been reinforced. It, it would have reinforced a shared maintenance of embodied and episodic memories from the diverse prisoner's past life. The, giving, the given and received objects that were part of this embodied memory triggering process made the past with all the humanity and personhood it contained for the prisoners more tangible, more accessible. If we bring, bring an economic anthropological perspective to uh, the inactivist affect focused approach to the embodied action and experience, material gifts may be seen as extrasomatic affordances for exchanging uh, episodic embodied narratives. The Ravensbrück collection at Kulturen shows how affect mediated um, exchange supported a politically daring economy of humanity production. In this paper, I have wanted to focus on the intentional and explicit production of material culture and art as acts of resistance and humanity production under extreme circumstances. Here, the object is not a permanent presence to become activated by interpretation and willed engagement, but rather an actively produced materiality, always charged and active, almost magic in its power to affect change in bodily and psychological states of those producing and handling them, revealing an additional dimension to the concept of material culture that perhaps only is truly activated under extreme circumstances. And from this perspective, the dilemma between creating art and focusing on survival that um, was often described with regards to the ghetto and that we discussed extensively yesterday disappears. These objects are the foundation for survival. The traceless dead end was the intended fate for these items, and yet they were preserved through human deliberate action first as an art act of resistance and then as an act of preservation and evidence collection by Lakoshinsky. Today they are kept in the University Library in Lund and some of them are exhibited, allowing them to yet again metamorphose into evidence of past atrocities, available to become triggered, but with the most of their transformative power lying dormant behind the glass of the exhibition case. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, any questions from the audience? While they're getting prepared. Uh, my question is usually after the war, you know, it, was, uh, it wasn't exactly the first reaction of people uh, around Holocaust survivors to collect, uh, to collect items. So, what drove uh, Lakoshinsky actually to do it and to talk to these women and interview them and when it uh, happened, roughly? It's really interesting, and, and he is really a, a really interesting individual. He was an art historian who, who married a Swedish woman and moved to Lund. And during the 30s and 40s, Lund was not a particularly progressive town. And uh, he was often targeted for his political views. Uh, he, was, uh, he dedicated his life to documenting the atrocities that he knew was happening already uh, before the end of the war. He was so he Polish. was already, in, yes, he was Polish and he was already engaged in, in collecting evidence, which is something that we have also spent significant time on here uh, during these uh, two days to talk about. And so when he goes to meet these uh, refugees that are coming with the buses to Malmö, he comes, I think, first and foremost as a translator because many of these uh, uh, women were Polish. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, as they were uh, getting undressed to burn all of their belongings and get uh, hosed down and uh, disinfected, mm -hmm. uh, he noticed that they had all of these things. And I think maybe there somewhere was a, a merger between his art historian sensibilities and his political activism um, made him aware of the value of these objects. And, and what I think is, is, is most important in his work is not only the collection, but also the respect that he showed in these women in continuing to engage with them, uh, not only collecting what they had, but engage with them and, and, and uh, create conversations about what this meant for them. And um, uh, these interviews were then uh, uh, saved uh, and have, uh, have now been translated also. Uh, they, are, they exist in Polish, English, and Swedish at the uh, University of Lund. And that's fairly recent. But when was it actually first, uh, first time uh, 
uh, made available for public, the interviews, these objects, the story of Ravensbrück uh, survivors? I think the, uh, the exhibition, uh, the way that it was uh, curated and cared for, uh, at first it was with a Polish organization in Lund, and then it was donated to the museum. And uh, that was uh, curated in the 1990s, that that became, that they created this exhibition. Questions? I'll, uh, I'll utilize the mic once again. Uh, very much following on Lolita's question, uh, what do we know about the, let's say, initial reaction of these women? Because obviously you've quoted a lot of interviews where they explain what these objects meant to them, but uh, what was their reaction when they were offered to give them to, the at that moment, not a museum, not an exhibition, but just to private person, and uh, that's, I think, something very important for us as for museologists. We know that a lot of people consider that their personal experience or whatever is not important, where this object is too small, it's not part of the history. Um, and actually, I recently was in a seminar in Sarajevo, and there the, in the historical museum told about a collection of dolls certain person made as a, sort of, some sort of therapy during the Bosnian War, which he actually wanted to destroy rather than give to the museum because he thought that it's of no importance. So we know that a lot of people think that there are these personal trauma objects, we could say, are of no importance. Do we have anything, any reflections on that? I haven't seen that question being asked in the interviews, maybe for obvious reasons. I think what you're bringing up is very important. These would have been objects that sustained people uh, throughout this period of time, and they would also have been mementos of friendships and, and very personal objects. Um, and so I, I think that that is, I'm not sure if this was something that was, um, uh, if this was something that was difficult. I imagine that it would have been difficult, but maybe also there were, these women would also have been carrying around a lot of trauma and uh, even this last uh, transportation to a non-war zone, I think, can still be very um, uh, traumatic in so many ways, and, and, and uh, uh, uprooting and, and, and difficult, that now you're here and you're supposed to settle, and, and uh, congratulations. Um, so I, I think that from a museological point of view, this is really interesting, and it's something that as an archeologist and an anthropologist, uh, we are carrying around a, a very heavy um, um, disciplinary heritage uh, surrounding this uh, theft, uh, curation, uh, appropriation of items. And uh, I think that uh, in the interviews, I haven't seen that being treated enough, but I think that's a very valid and important question, specifically because of what these things would have meant. But I am, uh, that being said, I also think that uh, and this is something to just maybe situate uh, my paper uh, explicitly in this uh, section of the conference. We discussed earlier um, how uh, narratives are really, really important, and so is art. Uh, but I also think that these mundane objects are something that we, we all can, uh, can relate to in some ways. And I think that they are very privileged uh, places for uh, connecting to uh, a human dimension of the past and, and placing ourselves potentially at least somewhere closer to the humanity of these people. Hello. Uh, I, this is the question from the perspective of teacher. Are those stories and interviews and items with a good quality of the pictures are uh, on internet. The, you can find them at the uh, University Library in Lund has uh, the interviews, and you can go to the museum Kulturen and see some of the images. Yes, they. I mean, they are online. Yeah, the interviews are all online, which is. I'd like to add something um, about art in Ravensbrück. Halina Owomutski, uh, she was in prison uh, in Ravensbrück and uh, she said that uh, prisoners, women, ask her to, uh, 
to make their portraits and they exchange bread for, mm. <laughs> for those portraits. So it's shocking probably, but... I think that's a, yeah. that's a beautiful, um, a powerful story to, to make this point of uh, the value of somebody seeing your humanity and recognizing it. Hi, I have a question regarding, um, you said that it was a women's camp. Do yeah. you think that the objects made there um, were different if it was a mixed camp or if it was another type of camp? Do you think it played a role? I have thought a lot about this, bringing a gender perspective on this. Um, I was thinking that maybe these women were, had some survival strategies uh, because these were generations of not all of them, obviously, let's not generalize, but many of them would have learned handwork that could be used. And many, so I think that there, was a, there is a resilience in being able to, um, to make handwork and to, and we're uh, in cultures where handwork is often made by women and exchanged as, as gifts. And so if you come with that cultural practice with you, you have a, a venue for making, creating alliances. And that's why I was so interested in, Primo Le in the contrast with Primo Levi's experience of um, not having that, uh, having experienced that kind of solidarity and exchange uh, economy uh, of recognition. So I think that there is a gendered aspect to this and that the, um, the access to having uh, the, the handwork and also having done it in the past. So it's not something that you start now, but it's something that you can actually relate to. Like I used to do this when I was a kid and now I'm here, I'm doing the same thing. It, through the embodied engagement with this materiality of, of the technology that you're using, you're connecting to your past. And, uh, and then you can transfer the worth and value of that to somebody else. So I think there is a gendered component which was actually helping these women to harness the opportunity of, uh, of taking part in this practice. Thank you very much indeed. Can I ask you whether any newest logical uh, research has been done in terms of the analysis that you've done with um, prisoners in this, these circumstances and tactile act activity with regarding to how we're treating dementia patients at the moment. Mm. Has, has, any, has any cross fertilization research been actually looked at? That is really interesting, and I haven't. But I, I think that you are proposing something really interesting there because it also has to do with a radical shift of one's circumstances and maybe some, some deeply buried memories or strategies that, uh, to hold on to. So that's something that I will definitely look at. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Just a brief comment. I mean, there is a whole culture of women using um, cloth and, and sewing as mm -hmm. resistance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, in terms of art therapy, there is a kind of binding quality to sewing and stitching, mm -hmm. which I think would have a healthy kind of... I agree. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.